Anyhow, today is October 23rd, 2022. It's Sunday morning, a beautiful Sunday morning after a wonderful rain. You know, Native American people used to do rain dances. People used to think, oh, that's some kind of crazy black magic. No, it's not. It's worship. They're worshiping God. Thank you, God, for sending rain. Please send more rain. Just a different type of prayer. Today's sermon title is Jesus, a life-giving spirit, and the resurrection of human morality. And uh, I'm uh, Reverend or Pastor Walter Frank, Pastor of Heavenly Parents Holy Community of San Diego. And two of our grandchildren, we have three now, a fourth on the way. So we're going to begin with this, this from 1 Corinthians 15.45. So there's a real big conjecture. I, you know, again, I told you I read uh, Martin Luther's biography. And this giant battle between Catholics and Protestants and Lutherans and... What happened to Jesus' body, right? Some people, so some Christian sects thought, how can Jesus appear in the Eucharist if he's in bodily form in the kingdom of heaven, right? They thought, well, maybe he's in bodily form in heaven, so how could he be in the Eucharist? How could he be in two places at once? Martin Luther thought, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If he wants to be in two places at once, he can be in two places at once. But we think this answers the question more definitively then, then Jesus' physical body. Jesus' physical body changed in the twinkling of an eye, according to Corinthians. And it says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now this is specifically a reservation and a res sorry, a revelation and spiritual experience of Paul at one time he says, I was caught up into heaven, and I, uh, there I saw the angels and spirits, Jesus. And so Paul understood by his own experience that Jesus is now a life-giving spirit, which is good, right? That's what we believe. He's a life-giving spirit, spotty transformed in the twinkling of an eye, and now he's a spiritual being, which is not crazy to us. On the other hand, I read, also I read last week this other book called Useful Delusions. Just because they're skeptics, and I always like to read what the atheists write, because, uh, because they're usually not very coherent in real modern terms. And this is the power and paradox of self-deceiving brain. So they think, for example, they think Christianity is deceiving itself and have delusions that Jesus is still alive. So I will we'll write about this. From uh, the book Useful Delusions, an obsession with the afterlife is not unique to ancient Egypt. Every religious tradition holds some sort of belief about our faith after we die. As far as we know, religious beliefs have existed in every culture and in every society and at all times. Right? But they think, oh, it must be some kind of weird delusion. For centuries, philosophers and scientists have delved into the question of why religion exists and how it became so pervasive in the human world if it's just a myth or pretend. Karl Marx, for example, saw religion as the opiate of the people. Now, this is just my conviction. If anybody is calling on the mind of Karl Marx for an opinion, you're already a sick puppy. You're already doomed. It's, you're already wrong. Sorry. Only, only hundreds of millions of people have been tortured to death in the name of Karl Marx. So I think he's the wrong choice. If you're choosing him as, a, you know, your muse, then you're probably insane. Anyhow, uh, Sigmund Freud once called religious belief a universal obsessional neuroses. Richard Dawkins and members of the New Atheist Movement describe religious faith as delusions. Because, now he says this, now this is from the next paragraph, because when we look around we don't see people living forever and no one has ever seen someone come back from the dead. I thought, Clearly, you never read the New Testament. Clearly, you never studied anything or read anything about history of mankind. But then he says this. Then they're, but then they struggle. Because look, it's, on the other hand, addictions and neuroses and delusions imply sickness and dysfunction. Right? He, but he says, actually, the reality is hallucinations and delusions versus actual real spiritual experiences don't add up. For example, spiritual experience with the Spirit of Jesus Christ versus hallucinations. Hallucina hallucinations generally comprise, comprise disorderly events 
with hazy visions, right? If you had, you probably had, a, you're Bill Starr, you live in Las Vegas, probably had a hallucination or two. Usually they're not, uh, they're not coherent, right? They're bits and pieces, scary things that may or may not be true. On the other hand, spiritual experiences with the Spirit of Jesus Christ generally comprise orderly events with clear perceptions. People who see Jesus know they saw Jesus no matter what people tell them, no matter what they say, right? Uh, I've had hallucinations before. I had a real high fever one time, hallucinated my father died and cried and went crazy and things. But then I realized, that's ah, a hallucination. Hallucinations usually leave their subjects feeling disturbed and agitated. That was my experience with hallucinations. Spiritual experience, on the other hand, with the resurrected Jesus usually leave their subjects feeling peaceful and serene with a specific purpose in life. Hallucinations have little noteworthy long-term effect on the subject, right? On the other hand, spiritual experience with Jesus Christ are often profoundly life-transforming inspiring the subjects toward a more purposeful and spiritual reorientation of beliefs and lifestyle. So I thought what I'll do is I'll explain to you and show you some absolute concrete examples of spiritual experience with the living spirit of Jesus Christ that have changed human history. <clears throat> okay, number one for us, and this is really important, resurrection does not only mean to us the physical resurrection of a dead body. More likely to us, resurrection means the changing of one's attitude and spirit in relationship to God, uh, to the two commandments of God. One, love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. Two, love your neighbor as yourself. It also means spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and will to goodness resurrection. For example, today I want to speak about and elucidate the resurrection of emotion or sensory heart and love. 1 John 3, 14, we know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He, do, he who does not love his brother abides in death. So we believe resurrection, when you begin to change your life, begin to think of others ahead of yourself or think of God ahead of yourself, we call that a type of resurrection. So let's see. Philippians first one, uh, Philippians 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment. Philippi, Philippi is in Greece, and it was one of the first churches founded by Paul, and so he had a special love for the Philippians. And uh, what does he pray for them? That this idea of love growing, this is a Christian uh, ideal, right? Socrates doesn't talk about love growing. Aristotle doesn't talk about love growing. But St. Paul does. This is the central aspect of Christianity that Paul wishes to convey. This is what Christianity is, love of God and love of your neighbor. And so that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The second thing is that we're without offense toward other people. We don't hurt somebody else, right? That's the meaning, one of the meanings of resurrection. And next, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So fruits of righteousness are kindnesses, saving people, education people, saving their souls, and uh, which we'll see happens a lot. <clears throat> Number one, first act. Jesus, number one, is still alive and more powerful than you can possibly imagine. This is Acts 9, the Damascus Road, so where Saul is converted. Saul had been going around bringing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord and went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, the Christian way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he wanted to go to Damascus, Syria to find if there were any Christians there that he can imprison them, torture them, and kill them. That's St. Paul, before he was St. Paul. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He had a spiritual experience, right? Not a hallucination. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. You know what a goat is? 
Uh, a goad is what you do to whip a cow or whip a, a ox to make him work. Right? So he says, look, I'm working with all humanity and you're, you're fighting against me. Don't do that. Uh, so, trembling, he, so he, Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him, now listen to this, the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, <coughs> hearing a voice, seeing no one there. When, then Saul arose from the ground. When his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Okay, Ananias baptizes Saul. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision. So Ananias also has a vision. Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And so, so the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and, and in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So Ananias does that. So, he gives him a sight, uh, he has a vision of Jesus, and if you don't know the story, he goes to the deserts of Arabia for three years, where he receives a revelation from God, and after three years he goes to Jerusalem to meet Peter and the other apostles, right? Okay, so here's the question. Did Paul really live, and did he really have a vision from the living spirit of Jesus Christ? Of course we say yes, we believe easily. Uh, and is there any historical evidence that Paul was a real person? Evidence for the reality of Paul comes from the dozens of writers who quoted him with a within a generation of his death. So people, all, all kinds of Christians, non-Christians wrote about Paul and his work. Every single Christian source agrees that he was a real person. Clement, A.D. 95, mentioned Paul. Peter, our St. Peter, mentioned Paul. Ignatius, Polycarp, and many other late 1st century and early 2nd century writers mentioned Paul. That they could have been duped about the existence of the most important leader in all of Christianity, while people who were alive when Paul was alive is beyond the possibility of belief. So everybody knew Paul, wrote letters about Paul, talked about Paul, heard Paul. Uh, there's Philippians churches, there's Antioch, there's many churches that he found where people absolutely believe Paul was here. And... There is not a single example of an opponent of Christianity in the first two or three centuries who doubted his reality. It would have been like doubting that Seneca or Ovid or Cicero lived. Bart Ehrman, one of the biggest critics of the reliability of the Bible, has debated on scholarly atheists who claim that Paul is not real and struggles to not laugh at his atheist friends for making the foolish and unfounded claim that Paul was not a real person. So here's our experience. Paul is a real person. He preached. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He did all these things based on his vision of the living spirit of Jesus Christ. Right? Because Paul was visited by Jesus, the life-giving spirit, Galatians 1.12, New King James Version, this is what he says, For I neither received it from man, <coughs> nor was I taught it by another person, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ directly to me. So here's Paul, founder churches, uh, one of the biggest writers of uh, the New Testament, who testified that Jesus met me, talked to me, and educated me. There is irrefutable evidence of St. Paul's conversion experience. St. Paul testified at the cost of his imprisonment, beatings that Jesus had come to him. Right? And beyond Paul, Jesus has appeared to many other people, even to people in this room, right? Many of us believe and had spiritual experiences. And that changed their life. It did for me. And more importantly, Lives have been changed, raised up from misery to glory, and the world has changed because of Jesus, of Paul's vision of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Again, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, and this life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ has appeared to many people throughout human history who have changed human history. I'll give you a big example, right? Big one. In, me, in, the, in a memoir of the Roman emperor that Eusebius wrote after Constantine's death, called On the Life of Constantine, a miraculous appearance is said to have come in Gaul before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. That is, in his later version, the Roman emperor had been pondering the misfortunes that fell upon commanders who invoked the help of many different gods 
and decided to seek divine aid in the forthcoming battle from one god, the Christian god. Somehow, his mother Helena was a Christian, his son became a Christian. At noon, Constantine saw a cross of light imposed over the sun. Attached to it in Greek characters was a saying, in this, conquer. I don't read Greek. Not, but here now listen to this. Not only Constantine had this vision, but the whole army saw this miracle, right? This was a, this was a sign that they saw, the Cairo sign, right? And it says this, that, and then, but, and then after they saw this symbol, that night Christ appeared to the Roman emperor. Jesus himself appeared to Constantine uh, in a dream and told him to make the replica of the sign he had seen in the sky, which he would be a sure defense in battle. Is that interesting? The most powerful emperor says, I saw Jesus in a dream and I changed everything about Rome. Does that make sense? This is called the Cairo sign. It means the uh, X is a Chi sign and the P, the P is an R sign in uh, original Greek. <clears throat> Cairo is one of the earliest forms of Christogram formed by superimposing the first two capital letters, Chi and Rho, the Greek word uh, Christos, in such a way that the vertical stroke of the row intersects the center of the, of the chi. Okay, here's what happens. This is real history. If you don't, don't believe in Jesus or you think it's an illusion, Constantine had this experience. The Cairo symbol was used by the Roman Emperor Constantine as a part of his military strength. This really happened. We know it happened. We have archaeological evidence that this happened. How did it happen? It was a spiritual experience by... Uh, by Constantine, who have no reason to trick anybody, right? According to Eusebius, Constantine also had a dream that same night. And in the dream, the Christ God appeared to him with the sign which had appeared in the sky and urged him to make himself a copy of the sign which had appeared in the sky and to use it as a protection against the attacks. So this Cairo sign became everywhere in the Roman Empire, right? In fact, after Constantine, the Cairo became part of the official imperial insignia. So now if you were a Roman emperor, you would put the Cairo sign on your emperor sign, right? Archaeologists have, un have uncovered evidence demonstrating that the Cairo was emblazoned on the helmets of some late Roman soldiers. Coins and medallions minted during Emperor Constantine's reign also bore the Cairo sign, right? But beforehand, the Romans were doing nothing but persecuting Christians. This is clearly a miracle, right? This is clearly a miracle, not a delusion, because it changed the world in a heavenly way. For example, Christians suffered from sporadic and localized persecutions over a period of two and a half centuries. Just suffering. We know that were tortured. Their refusal to participate in the imperial cult was considered an act of treason and was thus punishable by execution. The most widespread official persecution was carried by Diocletian beginning when? In 303. When was Constantine's conversion? About 327. During the Great Persecution, the Emperor ordered Christian buildings and the homes of Christians torn down and their sacred books collected in burns. So what did Christians do? They prayed to God, help us, send us somebody, send somebody to save us because they're killing us, murdering us, torturing us, destroying our books, etc., etc. Christians were arrested, tortured, mutilated, burned, starved, and condemned to gladiatorial contests to simply amuse spectators. But what happened? Constantine's decision to cease the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire was a turning point for early Christianity, sometimes referred to as the triumph of the church, the peace of the church, or the Constantine shift. And by the way, this is what we're praying for in our movement, that we find our own Constantine who changes everything overnight, from a persecuted minority to an approved, blessed uh, group. Okay, so to me... When I hear spiritual experiences, I like for the, what was the reality of those events? What happened to save mankind? This is God, right? A direct result of Constantine's fourth century vision is the creation of hospitals. Did you know that? For example, the Romans did not have dedicated or public hospitals, or in public hospitals, say, did not exist until the Christian period. Don't you like hospitals? Do you have a bone set? Do you have a, you know, you broke your arm, you went to the hospital, they saved you, you had a baby, you went to the hospital, and you had an antiseptic birth of your children, and your children lived? Isn't that great? Who started that? Christians. When did they start it? After Constantine said Christianity should not be persecuted anymore. Watch. 
towards the end of the fourth century. Towards the end of the fourth century, when was Constantine's vision? At the beginning of the fourth century, right? 320, something like that. The second medical revolution took place with the founding of the first Christian hospital in the Eastern Byzantine Empire of Basil of Caesar by Basil of Caesarea. And within a few decades, such hospitals have become ubiquitous in Byzantine society. The hospital will undergo development and progress through Byzantine, medieval, European, and Islamic societies from the 5th to the 15th centuries. European explorations brought hospitals to colonies in North America, Africa, and Asia. Early Chinese and Japanese hospitals were established by who? Western Christian missionaries. Is that something to be grateful for, Asian brothers and sisters? Praise God, praise Jesus, and praise Constantine, and praise Jesus for giving a vision to Constantine that allowed Basil to create the first hospital. Could he have created this hospital while they're killing all, every Christian they could find? No! Only after Constantine could Christianity flourish. Right? And so then the hospitals went all over the whole world. During World War I and World War II, many military hospitals and hospital innovations were created. Oh, wrong button. In the late 1900s and 21st century, hospital networks and governmental health organizations were formed to manage groups of hospitals to control costs and share resources. For example, I was born in Mercy Hospital in San Diego. Anybody else born in Mercy Hospital? First hospital in San Diego was a Catholic hospital called uh, Mercy Hospital, and it was run by nuns and Catholic priests. And if you were born there or went there later, you would see nuns and Catholic priests everywhere telling doctors what to do. Save this guy, save this guy. This is a, this is a direct result of what? Jesus' message in Matthew 25, help heal the sick, take care of the poor, right? So that's what Christians did. And if you want to study this, you can go to Wikipedia, History of Hospitals. It's available, public knowledge. Anybody can understand these things. That's why I think atheists who don't recognize the effects of Jesus' spirit are just ignorant. It's, it's in the Wikipedia. Okay, next. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Did Jesus' spiritual visions of people give life to people? Yeah. How many people have been saved by hospitals? Millions? Hundreds of millions? Billions of people saved by the modern hospital created by uh, St. Basil? Yeah, millions of people have been given their life by this, by Jesus' experience. How about this one? In the late 1700s, when William Wilberforce was a teenager, English traders raided the African coast on the Gulf of Guinea, captured between 35,000 and 50,000 Africans every year, shipped them across the Atlantic, and sold them into slavery. It was a profitable business that many powerful people had become dependent on, very rich, evil people, right? One publicist, for the West Indies trade wrote, the impossibility of doing without slaves in the West Indies will always prevent this traffic from being dropped. The necessity, the absolute necessity then of carrying it on must, since there's no other, be its excuse. So, you know, rich people enslaved black Africans to do this. By the late 1700s, the economics of slavery were so entrenched that only a handful of people thought anything could be done about it. That handful included who? William Wilberforce. And I'm going to tell you a little about his spiritual conversion to Christianity, which allowed him to destroy the slave trade. Isn't this amazing? Wilber Wilberforce, who was a rich kid, all the bad rich things, Wilberforce began to reflect deeply on his life, which led to a period of intense sorrow. He said, I am sure that no human creature would suffer more than I did for some months, he later wrote. His unnatural gloom lifted on when? Easter, 1786, amidst a general chorus with which nature seems on such a morning to be swelling the song of praise and thanksgiving. He had experienced a spiritual rebirth by who? Jesus Christ. He abstained from alcohol and practiced rigorous self-examination as befit, he believed, a serious Christian. So now he has a spiritual experience of Jesus, becomes a Christian. What happens to him? William Wilberforce was a parliamentarian and man about town when he became convinced of the truth of Christianity. Upon his conversion, he thought he should withdraw from Parliament. Because they're all, he writes, you, you, you know, there's much more to this. I can only put a little bit. He writes, 
every party was a drinking party. Every evening you, they drank to oblivion. Upon his conversion, he thought he should withdraw from Parliament. <coughs> but Pastor John Newton, <coughs> author of the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, convinced him otherwise. No. Use your position for God's will. God had placed him in Parliament for some useful purpose. Thought the wise old pastor had been a slave in his wild youth. So John Newton also had a spiritual experience, right? He fell off his slave ship, almost drowned, and pledged to God, if I don't drown here, I'll become an anti-slaver, which he did, right? So, all these spiritual experiences add up to... So, in particular, two causes caught his attention. First, under the influence of Thomas Clarkson, he became absorbed with the issue of slavery. Later, he wrote, so enormous, so dreadful, so irre irremediable, did the trade's wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for abolition. Let the consequences be what they would. I from this time determined that I would never rest and I had effected the abolition of slavery. Okay, where does the abolition of slavery come from? Came from a vision of Jesus Christ. His anti-slavery efforts finally bore fruit in 1807. So, when, was, when did he begin? Uh, 1786, 1807, what is that, 21 years later? He then worked to ensure that the slave trade laws were enforced and finding that slavery in the British Empire was abolished. Wilberforce's health prevented him from leading this last charge, though he heard three days before he died that the final passage of the Emancipation Bill was insured. And then the next part is Britain's war against the slave trade. Not only did they abolish slavery, they went to war against slave traders. Did you know that? That's amazing, isn't it? Did any other country go to war against slavery? Did the Romans go to war? No, they enslaved more people. Did the Greeks go to war against? No, they didn't. Did the Muslim countries go to war against? No, they didn't. They still had slaves until 1936. Did any other country go to war against slavery? No. But the British did under the guidance of Wilberforce, under the guidance of Jesus Christ. So you should remember this and tell all your friends, right? The West African Squadron was known, also known as the Preventative Squadron, was a squadron of the British Royal Navy whose goal was to suppress the Atlantic slave trade by, trolling the, by patrolling the coast of West Africa. Formed in 1808 after the British Parliament passed the Slave Trade Act in 1807, over the course of its operations it managed to capture around 6% of the transatlantic slave ships and freed around 150,000 Africans that were being sent to slavery in the West. Between 1830 and 1865, over 17,000 sailors died during the duty with the squadron, principally of disease. So, we say Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Did Jesus, through Wilberforce, through the anti-slave squadron, save the lives of 150,000 African slaves? Yeah, it's right here. It's written down. Jesus saved these people through using Wilbur Wilberforce. Is that good? Yeah, we should all, yay! What, was that a delusion? No, not for results in the, in, in the Savior. Um, actually, tens of thousands more than that, right? We call this a resurrection. This is a resurrection on a national and international level where the morality now of love your God is your, uh, with all your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, loving your neighbor is now effectively made into saving people from slavery, right? This is the intervention of the life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ upon the history of humanity. And we should praise it, and we should praise God, and we should thank God for this action. So this is what happens. Direct intervention. So what happens to people after this? Britain's war against the slave trade. The accounts of these sailors who sailed in the West Africa squadron only encouraged support for their anti-slavery initiative. That is, the public eagerly followed up on the stories of the liberation of slaves by the Navy by the mid-19th century. So the, the people in, in England were cheering when they would write back, we found the slave ship, we saved 10,000 slaves, or whatever they did. People in England would cheer. Is that, is that important to know? Because this is the growth of brotherly love amongst humanity, right? The public eagerly followed uh, Liberation of slaves by the Navy, and by the mid-19th century, around 25 ships and 2,000 sailors were based at the squadron's station. Though approximately this many also died while on duty with the squadron. So that's pretty sad, right? Nevertheless, the job of the squadron member became a celebrated 
one that Brits back home commended with reverence and respect. Isn't that important? That now the idea of saving people from slavery, now you're a hero. Some of the crew members in the squadron were themselves of African descent, and by 1845, around 1,000 experienced African fishermen were involved. <clears throat> Why should we understand and share this? Because this is real, visible, measurable experience with the life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ that has visual, measurable, beneficial effects on society. So when people say it's delusional, or you're crazy, or why would you believe in Jesus, show them this information. This changes mankind for, for the better. Save thousands, millions of lives. Okay, one more thing. One of the things atheists say is, well, Christianity didn't end slavery in the first century. It's true. We know they didn't end slavery in the first century. Because most of them were in jail themselves, by the way. Peter was in jail. P Peter was crucified. Paul was in jail, finally beheaded. Uh, Thomas was killed. James was killed. The only apostle to not be killed themselves was John, who died of, a, of old age in about 98 uh, AD. So everything we say, everything grows by stages. That is, plants start from a seed, seedling, young plant, mature plant, and finally have seeds and, and give birth to more plants. Resurrection begins by stages. For example, human beings, no human being grows, comes out of the womb fully grown, right? Thank God, mothers, you should cheer. You began as a single cell zygote, then a fetus, then an infant, then a child, then an adolescent, then a teenager, and finally you become an adult. Is there anything after that? Yeah, then finally you become a mature adult after 20s, Teenagers, well, anyhow. So next, resurrection happens by stages. It's the same thing with knowledge. Knowledge happens by stages. For example, uh, knowledge, uh, Pythagoras, back in the early centuries, about around 200 B before Christ, Pythagoras writes the Pythagorean theorem. One of few proofs that we say begins science, right? Euclid begins geometry, writes his book about geometry. Aristotle teaches us about hydrology. But none of these people understood astronomy or almost anything else, right? It's just the beginning. Galileo finally begins the science of metrology, of measurement. Protestants, people always say, atheists always say, Catholics hated science and didn't want to have science and astronomy. You see, yeah, a certain amount of Catholics rejected Galileo's argument. But you know why we believe in it now? Because Protestants did accept his arguments. Protestants loved Galileo. For example, uh, Tycho Brahe was a Protestant uh, Swedish uh, astronomer who mapped the stars, and then Kepler, uh, uh, an astronomer, also strong Christian, uh, wrote, studied that it's ellipses, not circles around the sun, right? He, so they transformed astronomy, and their understanding came to Rene Descartes, who made analytical geometry, right? Goes from Euclid to Descartes, and we can finally get analytical geometry. Analytical geometry goes to Isaac Newton, who invents calculus, modern physics, understands the laws of gravity, laws of motion, laws of light. Uh, that information goes to Francis Bacon, who codifies Newton's methods, giving us what? Modern science. So science didn't never happen just in one instant. Why didn't they just know about a heliocentric universe back in Greece? They didn't know that. But eventually we do. And it's the same thing with Christianity. It's the same thing with Christianity. So, same thing with Christianity. When did slavery end? We know. Freedom and Human Brotherhood. 1807, 27th of March. Abolition of the Slave Trade Act. Abolishes slave trading in British Empire. Captains are fined 120 pounds per slave. If they caught a captain with slaves on a ship, they would charge him big money. 1807, the British began patrols of African coast to arrest slaving vessels. The West African Squadron is established to suppress slave trade by 1865. Nearly 150,000 people freed by anti-slavery operations, right? So 1807, 1806 is the big mark. But then listen to this. 1783, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruled slavery unconstitutional. So there were no slaves in Massachusetts. You know that? It was against the law. You couldn't have a slave in Massachusetts. A decision based on the Christian conscience of, and Massachusetts Constitution. All slaves were immediately freed from Massachusetts. 
1783, New Hampshire begins a gradual abolition of slavery. 1784, Connecticut becomes a gradual abolition of slavery, freeing future children of slaves and later all slaves. 1784, Rhode Island begins a gradual abolition of slavery, right? Baptist Church of slavery. So, so same as science grows, same as plants grow, same as humans grow, the Christian message grows. Grows by what? Faith. As more Christians have more and more faith, God's ability to work on the earth grows more and more powerful, more and more obvious. 1830s, Baptist churches became sharply divided over slavery, with most Southern Christians, Southern Baptists, seeking to justify slavery on biblical grounds. Not true. Northern Baptists insisted on the equality of all men before God. In 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention broke away from the Northern Baptists. <coughs> Reverend Ward Beecher over... over uh, Slavery. Reverend Ward Beecher, Harriet Beecher. Henry Ward Beecher wanted to become a sailor. But after an intense religious conversion, he also has a vision of Jesus Christ, decided on the ministry instead. His religious feelings were marked by an emotional tenderness, and listen to this, a deep sensitivity to the motherly heart of God. Right? Who, who else believes in the motherly heart of God? Us, right? The greatest religious order of the 1850s, Beecher used words with the skill of an artist creating a masterpiece. Adamant to his opposition to slavery, he challenged America to recapture the vision of one nation under God. Right? <clears throat> Do that. Harriet Beecher Stowe, that's his daughter, believed in herself to be an instrument of God when she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book sold more than 300,000 copies in one year. Remember, there's, there's only 15 million Americans, so that's a lot of adults. Public apathy towards slavery quickly changed to a public compassion for the victims of slavery and public revulsion and outrage at the slavery system itself. Quakers in slavery. Quakers are a religious group founded by a vision of Jesus Christ. Much like the good Christians that helped Jews escape Germany during World War II, Quakers and other Christians helped African Americans escape slavery. This was called the Underground Railroad. <clears throat> they did this at the risk of their lives, by the way. George Fox, founder of the Quaker movement, began with a vision of Jesus Christ. Historians mark 1652 as the beginning of the Quaker movement. One day Fox climbed up a desolate Pendle Hill, believed to be the haunted demons, and saw a people in white raiment coming to the Lord. The vision signified that proclaiming Christ's power over sin would gather people to the kingdom. And it did. By 1660, there were 50,000 followers. Before the Civil War, we think there were 500,000 Quakers in the, in, in the United States. And they were all anti-slavery. Horace Bushnell, in his 1846 book, Christian Nurture, wrote, America had been given a special purpose and mission by God in line with the direction which God inspired the Puritan col to colonists to build a thoroughly Christian nation. He spoke out sharply from his pul pulpit. He saw slavery as a miserable hypocrisy to our first principles and condemned the slaughter of the Indians. If there is a just God in heaven, he cannot be with us. Which brings us to Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln rose to popularity as an abolitionist. That's what he said he was. I'm an abolitionist. In his 1860 campaign for president, Lincoln firmly expressed his opposition to slavery as a determination to limit the expansion of slavery westward into the new territories acquired from Mexico in 1850. So the new states, Texas entered as a slave state, Kansas, Missouri was not sure what they wanted to do, New Mexico, anti-slavery, California, anti-slavery, Oregon and Washington, anti-slavery. So when he becomes president, these states come in and they all opt to be anti-slavery states, what's going to happen when their representatives come to Congress, now you're going to have 20 more representatives in Congress and however many more, 10 more representatives in the Senate who are anti-slavery. And under President Lincoln, he vowed to vote slavery out just like Wilberforce did. So that prompted the, his, his election victory created a crisis over the nation. As many Southern Democrats feared that it would just be a matter of time before Lincoln and the Republicans in the Senate and Congress would move to kill slavery in the South. That was their plan. They didn't want, by the way, People all know, they write, well, Lincoln didn't want to go to war to end slavery. No, nobody wants to do. 700,000 people were killed in the Civil War. No, Wilberforce did it just by voting power in the Parliament. Didn't kill anybody. So that's what Lincoln thought. 
right? You know, got, these guys knew history. They knew what Wilberforce did. They didn't want to go to war. Rather than face a future in which black people might become free citizens, much of the white South supported secession. This reasoning was based upon the doctrine of states' rights, which placed ultimate sovereignty in the states. As Lincoln said of slavery, I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemies, free, as enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many really good men against ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty criticizing the Declaration of Independence and insisting that there's no right principle of action but self-interest. And that's exactly what atheists do today. Slavery was entered by Christians in Europe, England, and in the USA and elsewhere at the cost of hundreds of thousands of soldiers' lives in the Civil War. Some say Lincoln never intended to free slaves, but that's not true. You should have to, you could have never read any of his speeches to believe that. And number two, it's not true. If it was, why would he not reinstitute slavery if he had won the war and was for slavery. He was against slavery, so at the end of the war, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was signed by a Republican Abraham Lincoln into law in 1865, meant there would never be another slave in the United States forever. M hundreds of thousands of men and women died for the 13th Amendment to the United States Com Constitution. Isn't that significant? It all, and believe me, all this comes from the spiritual, life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ. The Christian message, triumph finally after 100 years, the Constitution finally fulfilled. These are just a few results of Jesus' life-giving spirit changing the world in pursuit of Christ, Christ's great kingdom. There's th hundreds, thousands of more, right? I just wanted to show you some that are indisputably clear that the vision of Jesus created these changes in human morality and human brotherhood. Each of us are blessed by these actions. You're blessed by hospitals. None of you are slaves here in the room, thank God. All the things we receive from Christianity. These actions are not the result of delusions. These, this is the real visible power of the living spirit of Jesus Christ. It's very real and it continues. And Jesus Christ and, God, and God's desires are not done yet. However, each accomplishment is based upon the faith of the people. The future will be de determined by our and world Christianity's faith in God. The last person I mentioned is our own true father was visited by Jesus and we are blessed in holy matrimony. Why? Because Jesus appeared to Reverend Sun Myung Moon in 8, 1936. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for listening to me. I hope that wasn't too boring to you. I hope it was interesting and you like it and that you share it with all other people you know. Amen? Amen. God bless you.